most distinctive and challenging feature of Vladimir Nabokov's Pale Fire is its form. Pale Fire takes the form of an academic commentary written by a professor of literature named Dr. Charles Kinboat. And this is a commentary on a 999 line poem in four cantos written by another professor of literature by the name of John Shade. The title of that poem of John Shade is Pale Fire. There can be no doubt that Pale Fire is a lot less shocking than Nabokov's famous Lolita. In Pale Fire, there are no, there's no pornography, there's no harrowing descriptions of pedophilia, rape, child abuse, but I think there are some important stylistic parallels between these two books nonetheless. Both these books are written from the perspective of an unreliable narrator who is simultaneously brilliant and crazy. For me, a Nabokovian character is a literary character who is incredibly eloquent, who is seductive in the writing, but the more we read from them, the more obvious it becomes that this person is outrageously crazy. It seems to me that in Pale Fire, Nabokov is experimenting with this medium of intertextual annotation. He's trying to see if he can enlarge that genre. He's addressing the question, is it possible to fit a novel in the form of a line-by-line -line annotation to a poem? What would that even look like? Because of this unique form, Pale Fire explores a tension that exists between art and criticism, between author and commentator, primary texts and secondary texts. As readers, we would expect a commentary on a poem to have some relationship with the content of that poem. For example, the themes and images that the poet John Shade was trying to communicate in his poem. But Professor Kinboat's commentary hardly acknowledges anything in the underlying poem, let alone try to explain it. For the most part, Kinboat's commentary is so verbose and self-assured and independent, it completely overshadows and overwhelms the underlying poem. Far from explaining John Shade's poem and his intent, Kinboat's commentary effectively destroys that poem and reimagines Shade's words as something completely new and unrelated to what an unbiased reader would find there. Taken at its face, the Pale Fire poem is a raw and anguished meditation on mortality. The memorable opening lines of Shade's Pale Fire, quote, I was the shadow of the waxwing slain by the false azure in the window pane. End quote. A waxwing is a kind of bird, and this is one of the few places in the whole poem where Kinboat's commentary actually elucidates the underlying poem. On this opening line, Kinboat notes, quote, The image in these opening lines evidently refers to a bird knocking itself out in full flight against the outer surface of a glass pane in which a mirrored sky with its slightly darker tint and slightly slower cloud presents the illusion of continued space. End quote. At the heart of Shade's poem is a description of his daughter Hazel's suicide. This is a trauma that echoes throughout the whole poem. Quote, People have thought she tried to cross the lake at Loken Neck where zesty skaters crossed from X to Y on days of special frost. Others suppose she might have lost her way by turning left from Bridge Road and some say she took her poor young life. I know. You know. It was a night of thaw, a night of blow, with great excitement in the air. Black Spring stood just around the corner, shivering, in the wet starlight and on the wet ground. The lake lay in the mist, its ice half drowned. A blurry shape stepped off the reedy bank into a crackling, gulping swamp and sank. End quote. Elsewhere in the poem, Shade reflects on mortality and 
his hope of a resurrection. Quote, what moment in the gradual decay does resurrection choose? What year? What day? Who has the stopwatch? Who rewinds the tape? Are some less lucky, or do all escape? A syllogism. Other men die, but I am not another. Therefore, I'll not die. Space is a swarming in the eyes, and time a singing in the ears. In this hive I'm locked up, yet, if prior to life we had been able to imagine life, what mad, impossible, unutterably weird, wonderful nonsense it might have appeared. End quote. These themes of mortality and tragedy are completely absent from Kinboat's commentary. In the mind of Kinboat, Shade's poem is really about a country named Zembla, an exiled Zemblin king. The fact that Kinboat is writing all this in the style of serious and very self-assured academic commentary makes his obliviousness even more absurd. Commenting on line 747 of the poem on the words, quote, a story in a magazine about Mrs. Z, end quote, Kinboat writes, quote, anybody having access to a good library could no doubt easily trace that story to its source and find the name of the lady, but such humdrum potterings are beneath true scholarship, end quote. In this character of Charles Kinboat, I see Nabokov satirizing his own critics, those people who he feels have distorted his writing and invented absurd interpretations or harsh criticisms, while all the time failing to appreciate the ideas that Nabokov was actually trying to express in his writing. In his foreword to the poem, Kinboat criticizes the Pale Fire poem and argues for the necessity of his commentary to really appreciate this poem. He writes, quote, Let me state that without my notes, Shade's text simply has no human reality at all, since the human reality of such a poem, as is being too skittish and reticent for an autobiographical work, with the omission of many pithy lines carelessly rejected by him, has to depend entirely on the reality of its author and his surroundings, attachments and so forth, a reality that only my notes can provide." End quote. And then Kimboat's next sentence in that foreword perfectly epitomizes the whole essence of this Pale Fire project. In the next sentence, Kimboat writes, quote, To this statement, my dear poet would probably not have subscribed, but for better or for worse, it is the commentator who has the last word. End quote. Early on, we learn that John Shade is dead, and Kinboat has secured the legal rights to Shade's manuscript, and the right to publish the authoritative commentary on this poem. So Kinboat has the final word here, and there is nothing that Shade or anyone else can do about it. Throughout his commentary, Kinboat claims that he had a very deep and significant friendship with John Shade, but the stories that Kinboat provides make him sound a lot more like an intrusive neighbor than a close friend. From the foreword to the poem, quote, We never discussed, John Shade and I, any of my personal misfortunes. Our close friendship was on that higher, exclusively intellectual level where one can rest from emotional troubles, not share them. End quote. Another description of the relationship. Quote, Henceforth, I began seeing more and more of my celebrated neighbor. The view from one of my windows kept providing me with first-rate entertainment, especially when I was on the wait for some tardy guest. From the second story of my house, the shade's living room remained clearly visible, so long as the branches of the deciduous trees between us were still bare, and almost every evening I could see the poet's slippered foot gently rocking. End quote. In this amazingly nonlinear form of commentary on a poem, Kinbo weaves together a really interesting narrative from multiple threads. Through his annotations, we learn about the story of a Zemblin king named Charles the Beloved, who is deposed by Soviet-backed revolutionaries and is forced to escape his own country. Through Kinboat's annotations 
we follow another character named Gradus, who is an assassin dispatched from Zembla to track down and kill this exiled king. Additionally, in his annotations, Kinbo goes on long digressions about his relationship with John Shade the poet. Towards the end of his commentary, these threads come together. Kinboat reveals that he is actually Charles the Beloved, and we are told of a fatal encounter between Gratus and Kinboat, where the would-be assassin accidentally kills John Shade instead of him. Towards the beginning of his commentary, Kinboat gives us a very vivid and poetic description of the way his stories, specifically the story of Gratus, is woven throughout the commentary to this poem. Quote, his departure for Western Europe, with a sordid purpose in his heart and a loaded gun in his pocket, took place on the very day that an innocent poet in an innocent land was beginning Canto II of Pale Fire. We shall accompany Gratus in constant thought as he makes his way from distant dim Zembla to green Appalachia, through the entire length of the poem, following the road of its rhythm riding past in a rhyme, skidding around the corner of a run-on, breathing with the kajra, swinging down to the foot of the page, from line to line as from branch to branch, hiding between two words, reappearing on the horizon of a new canto, steadily marching nearer in iambic motion, crossing streets, moving up with his valise on the escalator of the pentameter, stepping off, boarding a new train of thought, entering the hall of a hotel, putting on the bedlight, while Shade blots out a word, and falling asleep as the poet lays down his pen for the night. End quote. Unlike H.H., the protagonist of Nabokov's Lolita, Dr. Kinbode is not a detestable abuser. However, he is an undeniably Nabokovian character, which is to say, Dr. Kinbode is completely crazy. It takes some time for the reader to figure out Kimboat's character, but what eventually emerges is the picture of someone who is profoundly out of touch with reality. In one of my favorite scenes in the book, Kimbo tells the following experience. Quote, the Goldware Chateau had many outside doors, but no matter how thoroughly I inspected them and the window shutters downstairs at bedtime, I never failed to discover next morning something unlocked, unlatched, a little loose, a little ajar, something sly and suspicious looking. One night, the black cat, which a few minutes before I had seen rippling down into the basement where I had arranged toilet facilities for it in an attractive setting, suddenly reappeared on the threshold of the music room, arching its back and sporting a neck bow of white silk, which it could certainly not have put on all by itself. I telephoned 1111, and a few minutes later was discussing possible culprits with a policeman who relished greatly my cherry cordial, but whoever had broken in had left no trace. It is so easy for a cruel person to make the victim of his ingenuity believe that he has persecution mania, or is really being stalked by a killer, or is suffering from hallucinations. Hallucinations! Well did I know that among certain youthful instructors whose advances I had rejected, there was at least one evil practical joker. I knew it ever since the time I had come home from a very enjoyable and successful meeting of the students and teachers, and found in my coat pocket a brutal anonymous note saying you have H-A-L dash 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 S, real bad chum, meaning evidently hallucinations. Although a malevolent critic might infer from the insufficient number of dashes that little Mr. Anon, despite teaching freshman English, could hardly spell. End quote. Later in the commentary, reflecting on the aftermath of Shade's death, Kinvote responds to his concern that no one agrees with his version of the events. Quote, I do not doubt that many of the statements made in this work will be brushed aside by the guilty parties when it is out. Mrs. Shade will not remember having been shown by her husband, who showed her everything, one or two of the precious variants. The three students lying on the grass will turn out to be totally amnesic. The desk girl at the library will not recall, will have been told not to recall, 
anybody asking for Dr. Kinboat on the day of the murder, and I am sure that Mr. Emerald will interrupt briefly his investigation of some mammate student's resilient charms to deny with vigor of roused virility that he ever gave anybody a lift to my house that evening. In other words, everything will be done to cut off my person completely from my dear friend's fate. End quote. Despite his obvious insanity, Kinboat is a wonderful writer. In describing the death of the Zemblin King Alfin, who was the predecessor to Charles the Beloved, he writes, quote, King Alfin's absent-mindedness was strangely combined with a passion for mechanical things, especially for flying apparatuses. A very special monoplane, Blenda 4, was built for him in 1916 by his constant aerial adjunct, Colonel Peter Gusev, later a pioneer parachutist and at 71 one of the greatest jumpers of all time. And this was his bird of doom. On the serene but not too cold December morning that the angels chose to net his mild, pure soul, King Alfin was in the act of trying solo, a tricky vertical loop that Prince Andrei Kachurin, the famous Russian stunter and World War I hero, had shown him in Gachina. Something went wrong, and the little Blenda was seen to go in an uncontrollable dive. Behind and above him, in a cauldron biplane, Colonel Gusev, by then Duke of Rall, and the Queen snapped several pictures of what seemed at first a noble and graceful evolution, but then turned into something else. At the last moment, King Alfin managed to straighten out his machine and was again master of gravity, when immediately afterwards, he flew smack into the scaffolding of a huge hotel, which was being constructed in the middle of a coastal heath as if for the special purpose of standing in the king's way. End quote. When describing Gratus immediately before his attempt at assassinating Kinbo, quote, From my rented Claudette, I contemplate him with quiet surprise. Here he is, this creature ready to commit a monstrous act and coarsely enjoying a coarse meal. We must assume, I think, that the forward projection of what imagination he had stopped at the act, on the brink of all its possible consequences, ghost consequences, comparable to the ghost toes of an amputee, or the fanning out of additional squares which a chess knight, that skip space piece, standing on a marginal file, feels in phantom extensions beyond the board, but which have no effect whatever on the real moves, on the real play. End quote. Annotating line 962 of the poem, on the words, Help me, Will, Pale Fire, Kinboat writes, quote, Paraphrased, this evidently means, let me look in Shakespeare for something I might use for a title. And the find is, Pale Fire. But in which of the bard's works did our poet call it? My readers must make their own research. All I have with me is a tiny vest pocket edition of Timon of Athens in Zemblin. It certainly contains nothing that could be regarded as equivalent to pale fire. If it had, my luck would have been a statistical monster. End quote. In a different annotation, Kimbo vehemently disparages the practice of choosing titles from celebrated poetical works in this way. Commenting on the words, The Untamed Seahorse, Kimbo writes, quote, See Browning's My Last Duchess see it, and condemn the fashionable device of entitling a collection of essays or a volume of poetry or a long poem, alas, with a phrase lifted from a more or less celebrated poetical work of the past. Since anybody can flip through A Midsummer's Night Dream or Romeo and Juliet or perhaps the sonnets and take his pick. End quote. On the one hand, Pale Fire is the title of a 999 line poem written by the fictional John Shade. But Pale Fire is also the title of a novel, which is centered on the manic and bizarre notes of Charles Kinboat. This dual sense of the title Pale Fire is underscored by the fact that Kinboat explicitly disparages Shade's title, and then proceeds to undermine and subvert that title, and to reappropriate it with his own choice of mental image for the words pale fire. When I think about pale fire now, 
It's Kinboat's dramatic picture that comes to mind first. In describing Shade's writing process, Kinboat writes, quote, As a rule, Shade destroyed drafts the moment he ceased to need them. Well do I recall seeing him from my porch on a brilliant morning, burning a whole stack of them in the pale fire of the incinerator, before which he stood with bent head like an official mourner among the wind-borne black butterflies of that backyard, Otto de Fe. End quote. 